Hello, Disopay. It's nice to be here. Today, I'm going to talk about Tor de anonymizing techniques. I'm going to look at cases where people have lost their anonymity, although they have been using Tor. So what is Tor? It's actually easy to explain here, because I think most of you, almost, almost everyone, has been using Tor, like Tor browser. How many of you have been using Tor browser? Yeah, almost everyone. So you know that Tor is a free software. It's an open network that helps people to keep their, their online activity uh, anonymous. So you, you can have privacy if you use Tor browser, because, for instance, large corporations are unable to see where your traffic is originally coming from. And you can hide your traffic from internet surveillance. So basically, it's anonymous TCP connection. It offers censorship circumvention and privacy. And how it works, if you are using Tor, your traffic is routed to, through these hops, these relays, these Tor relays, and it's encrypted. So if, if, you, are an, if you are Alice, and you want to connect to Bob or Jane here. Jane can be, for instance, wikipedia.org. And if you are living in a country where wikipedia.org is censored, you can use Tor to get through the censorship, because the connection, the first hop, is connection to Tor network. Not, you are not connecting directly to wikipedia.org. And because you, you are encrypting your traffic, the local surveillance cannot know what you are looking. The local surveillance only sees that there is encrypted traffic going to Tor network. So how large its Tor, how large Tor network is? This is a very relevant question if we think about how Tor forms anonymity. The network has to be huge, because if you are the only one using the network, or if there is only a few people using Tor network, then it cannot provide anonymity, because it's really hiding your traffic inside a large crowd of, of people using Tor. So at the moment, Tor network has over 4 million users every moment, directly connected users. Think about it, 4 million users. That's a large anonymity set to hide. The number of relays is almost 7,000. So the number of routing devices is huge, too. And then, as you know, you can host content inside Tor network. Tor provides this function to create dot .onion addresses. And you can publish any TCP servers in .onion address. And if you are using .onion address, you are hiding the real IP address of the server. So if you are, for instance, hosting a website using an Onion address, then it's very hard to know where the physical server is and what is the real IP address of the server. Of course. You, you have to use Tor to connect these addresses. So if you are using a Tor browser, then you can connect to Onion addresses and, for instance, look the web pages that are hosted on Tor network. But the question is, how secure is Tor? This is a pretty hard question, because many journalists are calling to me and asking the question like this, is Tor secure? And then I try to explain that I cannot really tell anything about security in, in that way that is something absolutely secure or is it not. This is because security doesn't work like that. I cannot like say that, OK, the encryption works. But then I cannot really say anything about how secure it is for you. And when I try to explain this, they usually try to ask something like, 
just give us one sentence that explain how secure Tor is. And I was like, well, it's hard to explain that. But let's look something. Uh, it is said that Thor is the king of uh, anonymity. So, like this. And the source for this information comes from top secret NSA slides. Where is the sentence that uh, Thor is still the king of high secure, low latency internet anonymity. And this information comes from top secret NSA slides. So NSA sees that Tor is pretty secure. They, they, they actually say, say it there, very secure. Also on the other NSA slide set, they say, they say that they will never be able to de-anonymize all Tor users all the time. But with manual analysis, they, they are able to de-anonymize some Tor users sometimes. They also mentioned that it's hard to respond to these requests. I don't know actually what that request means, but it probably means that if they have a target, it's hard to de-anonymize de a certain target. But uh, it's probably easy to de-anonymize de some random Tor, Tor users. Another NSA slide. They are like looking what is their threat model, what is the most catastrophic situation for them. The most catastrophic situation for NSA is that people use something like Tor, uh, full disk encryption, and live Linux distribution like Tails. It's a live Linux distribution that is routing every piece of traffic through Tor network. And this is like the catastrophic situation for NSA surveillance. Another slide tells the same story. If you are using, for instance, uh, ZRTP voice encrypt encryption, Linux, Tor, then you are pretty safe from NSA surveillance because it's, we know that it's hard to break these systems. It's hard to break break this kind of uh, stack of security software. And it's catastrophic for them because it will probably consume their resources to make surveillance. And what you actually see from these slides, that encryption really works. Because if you look at the NSA slides, every time there is encryption, they are telling that it's a problem. Encryption is a problem for them. So you pretty much can tell that encryption works itself. And why we know this information? No. We know it because Edward Snowden leaked these this, uh, top secret NSA slides. And if you look at the first photograph of him, you can see that he has a laptop where is actually Thor sticker there. And Edward Snowden himself was using Thor when he was contacting journalists and sharing this information to them. Well, another, another, another thing to consider, we constantly, constantly hear these stories that somebody has lost their anonymity and got caught doing something while they were using Tor. So there, there are multiple cases where people have done something using Tor, and after that they have got arrested or something. So there have these ca cases. I went through these cases and decided to categorize them to four categories because they fitted pretty well under these four categories. The first one is that operation security is difficult. The second one, you can always attack, attack on end user device. The third one, you can attack hidden services multiple ways. Usually because if you are using the hidden service, 
Obviously, you are installing some software there and providing some service. And for instance, if you are just installing some web framework there, of course, we can try to hack the web framework. That's what we usually do with public services. And it's, it's usually somehow doable to hack any kind of web framework, at least to give some piece of information. And finally, traffic and timing correlation attacks. It actually works too. In some, under some circumstances, you can do traffic and timing correlation attacks against Tor. But the first one, operation security is difficult. It it's really is, because if I would try to hide some, for instance, criminal activity behind Tor network, I know that I would make a lot of large mistakes here because, because I think the people who have, who have tried to run large drug markets behind Tor and have got, got caught, these people have been pretty clever. They actually know about operation security. They know about security, but still they make these mistakes. And the definition of operation security from Wikipedia basically says that you shouldn't share any kind of information about your operation or any kind of information that can be somehow gathered together over time to understand what you are doing. But it's really hard to do that. We people, we tend to share information. And we don't think about that that much. So we are telling some pieces of information about ourselves, even behind anonymity. So let's look at the first, first case here. Case First Silk Road, Ross Ulbricht. He was actually sharing a lot of information about himself. He was telling always pieces of information like, by the way, I live in the Pacific Standard Time Zone. I have done this these, these things before. And he even ordered some fake card ID license. And the US Custom intercepted this packet. And same time, he was in Silk Road service telling that he, is, he wants to have these fake IDs. And actually, FBI was correlating this, that, OK, this, uh, this guy who runs Silk Road talked about this, and this happens simultaneously. And if you are doing something like this, is, if US Custom has a packet where it's same face, different name, and multiple driver licenses, they are definitely going to look what you are you are doing. You are under surveillance after that. This doesn't look good. This looks like you are doing something very criminal. And same time, Ross was doing multiple things. He created Silk Road Marketplace. And after that, he was the first one to tell that this marketplace exists. He also created this portal on WordPress. And again, felt that there is this portal too. He was using Altoid nickname on shroomery.org and told about Silk Road. He was using Altoid nickname on Bitcoin Talk Forum and was sharing information that, by the way, you can sell and buy drugs from Silk Road here. And after that, he even posted a job offer on Bitcoin Talk and added an email address there that was Ross, Ross, Ross Ulbricht at Gmail, if I remember correctly. So he was actually telling his real name there. After that, he posted questions to Stack Overflow that he has this PHP, PHP coding problem. And there, he was using his real name again. After that, he probably realized that, OK, this is pretty stupid to ask about questions about how to build drug market and how, how to make connections to Tor network and use his real name there. So he decided to change the real name there to Frosty. 
but that was too late because the FBI already noticed that and took a screenshot from that page and it was an evidence that, okay, this Ross is doing something very, very weird. And eventually uh, he got arrested. There was also technical details that pointed that Silk, where, where is the founder of Silk Road? It, it wasn't all about operation security, but as you can see, these pieces of uh, operation security failures over time already point that Ross is doing something very weird and shady. Like posting these kind of messages. Using the Altoid nickname that is directly linked to his uh, real identity. And he, he is not the only one. We saw this case last summer. So Alphabay Marketplace was shut down. And Alphabay was doing, uh, uh, I think it was billions of dollars of drug trade. So this guy has founded a marketplace and people are using billions of dollars to sell drugs there. And still he uses his normal email, hot, hotmail email address there. This is a public court file, so he was actually really doing that. It was on the off pay marketplace, welcoming email from this hotmail.com address. And this is actually the same email address he is using in his LinkedIn profile. So it's like I'm looking opportunities to get jail here. <laughs> But this is a real court case, he, he did that. So operation security seems to be pretty difficult. I'm pretty sure that this guy is very clever. I think he knows about security, but we, people do these mistakes still. Another case, uh, Oxymonster, he was uh, just, uh, he was operator on three market market place that was selling trucks. He was also selling trucks. And he decided to transfer some of the Bitcoins to local Bitcoins, where he had some wallets under his real name. And of course, police can detect that you are transferring Bitcoins from three, uh, three market forum to, to these local Bitcoins wallets. And after that, they just ask from local Bitcoins that, by the way, who owns these accounts? And uh, th those accounts were under his real name. So they arrested him when he was traveling to USA. He was going there to some uh, world bird growing championship in Austin. And he was arrested in, uh, in customs and they look at his laptop, it wasn't encrypted. So inside the laptop, there was evidence that he is really this oxymonster. There was, there was uh, locking passwords, all the bitcoins. It was worth something like half million there. Then I think it's something like five million these days. But all the evidence were there in his laptop. Second thing, you can always attack end user device. This is pretty clear. So if you are using any kind of secure communication method and the end, end user device, for instance, your laptop is compromised, after that it's game over. It doesn't help what kind of encryption you are using for your communication. And this happens too, because uh, usually people use uh, Tor browser if they are browsing dot onion sites and Tor browser is based on Firefox browser. So if there is a zero day exploit against Firefox browser, then you can use this exploit against Tor browser, obviously, usually. Usually these exploits are JavaScript exploits like year 2013, there was this malware script that FBI installed to this hosting service that was hosting like hundreds of Onion sites. 
the FBI took over the whole hosting system and after that injected this malware to every single Onion site there. And this JavaScript malware, if you have JavaScript enabled in your browser, in your Tor browser, it, and you are running it on, on Windows, then it executes this piece of script and uh, calls home. So basically, the script sends, sends the MAC address, host name, and of course, your real IP address to FBI servers. And after that, they know that you have the one who, who is clicking this Onion site. Again, three, three years from this, there was another JavaScript exploit. Again, against people who use JavaScript on Tor browser and who use Windows. I, I believe you can use these zero-day exploits against Linux too, but for some reason, most of the people are using Windows machines, so at the moment, these exploits have been targeting Windows machines and, and usually just calling home, telling the MAC address, IP address, and host name, that kind of information to, to, to FBI servers. But it goes further from this. Because you are using a browser, usually you are clicking links and opening whatever is behind the link. And that's how we use browsers. So it's not pretty safe in the sense that you are clicking every link, especially if you decide that you have to download something. That's hard if you try to keep your anonymity, because it's hard to tell what you should download, what files are safe to open, what files might contain malware or side effects for privacy. And of course, Tor browser tries to sell, tell you that please consider before downloading any piece of uh, files from net and consider that there might be exploits inside these files. But it's hard to tell what is actually safe to open from the net. For instance, mp3 file. I would like, before I thought about that, I was considering that maybe if you just download a music album, it's usually safe because mp3 format is quite simple. You shouldn't be able to maybe program anything there. But if you, for instance, download music al album, there is this M3U file that contains, uh, contains a link or file path to album cover. That's usually, usually there and other piece of metadata. And you can put a link there. So your media player our media players try after that download information from this link. And this can be a trap for anonymity. For instance, I could share this kind of music album through Tor, and people would open it. And after that, this small, small feature here calls home. It tries to download, for instance, the image cover from my server and tells the right tells the real public IP address of the user. And it gets even, even worse from there. I actually tested this, and the VLC player kindly asked, can I download this music cover from online source? And then I click it, no. And after that, it downloaded it anyway. And I noticed that there is this bug open on VLC player. They are not thinking that it's, they, they, it took a while to fix it because VLC player, the most popular video player, music player on Linux thought that this is a minor thing, that there is no hurry to fix this. But for, for privacy, this is actually can be critical because if your, if, if your music, if our music players are like this, that they ask, can I download something, and you click no, and they will download it anyway. 
that's kind of bad. You can actually break anonymity this way. So next, let's attack on hidden ser some hidden services. Very typical case is that people set up some web framework on Onion service. And because it is a web framework, everything can, everything can go wrong. For instance, web frameworks usually give some error messages. And the first Silk Road actually gave an error message which contained the real public IP address of the Silk Road server. And from here, Ross actually made the next operation security failure. He just removed the error message, but continued to use the server, even though it, it was leaking this information. He didn't even change the server location. And error messages, error messages usually tell a lot, of, a lot about your server and a lot about your installation and details about where the server might be, what software there is, maybe some hidden information, even the real public IP address. And many people install SSH server on Onion address. That's OK. You can do that. But they are installing the same SSH server through public IP address. Through and then it looks like this. For instance, I made the test using ahmia.fi, my public service, and, uh, and I installed the same SSH server to hidden service version of this site. And when I try to connect to the hidden service, it of course gives the SSH fingerprint. And when I try to connect to through public IP address to this, this site, it gives the fingerprint. And the fingerprint is the same. And it's like mathematically proven way to say that this is actually the same SSH server. And you can immediately see that this hidden service is the same, probably. OK, there are conditions that it might not be the same. But usually, this points that this public, public IP address is actually hosting the same SSH server than this onion address, and you can, break, you can break the anonymity that way. And it's pretty easy to scan this information from online sources. For instance, you could first scan every single .onion address and look if there, there are SSH servers, and after that, look the information from Shodan or something like that and find this, these pieces of information. So it's, it's easy to make this mistake. This is something that is sometimes hard to detect. So many web frameworks are treating local host as safe zone. This means that they are kind of like uh, expecting that if, if there are connections coming from local host, the local host is always safe. And you can, for instance, reveal information like info pages, admin user interfaces through localhost, and they usually consider that this is safe. But Tor is in localhost. So any web framework sees that traffic, is, traffic that is coming through Tor network is actually coming from localhost, because it's coming from Tor application that is run on localhost. And after that, many web frameworks treat those connections safe and reveal information. For instance, Apache HTTP server is relieving this uh, server status site on localhost. And if it's enabled, it actually shares the information through Onion address too. This information page is not highly critical. But it's still, it, it, it is still sharing information about the server, about the installation, operation system, uptime, information like that. And I can we, can we can look one example of this, where someone has installed an Onion server and 
share, share the server status information. Finnish police, when they took down Sipuli Kanava, they installed this, they, they changed the content of the site. Now there is only this image that they have took down this onion address. I have, I have no idea how they, how they did that, but they did that. But you can look actually that they have this server status information leaked there, which tells us some information like what is the, what is the uptime of the server, uh, what is the installation, what is the time zone, what connections there are active, how much traffic there is coming in and out. So in their case, it's not a problem because they, they, they are not they are not trying to be anonymous, but this is still information leak from their server. Pretty interesting one. And it's easy to make this mistake if you are a software developer. I actually made this mistake myself. So when I was coding the first version of ahmia.fi, I didn't have any hidden service then, but I I decided that, okay, I need just this simple information window and this user, in, user interface just for myself. And I decided that, okay, it's okay if I just access this from localhost and because I am the only one who is able to access the real machine, the localhost is safe. And about a year after that, I installed this uh, uh, same service through Onion address. And I didn't understand that I'm actually sharing now the admin user interface through the Onion address. I, I think I was lucky because I noticed it myself after a while. But many web frameworks are, they have pieces of code like this that look that, okay, if the source IP is localhost, then everything goes. It's safe to show information about the server. This is pretty, pretty normal case. And it's, a, of course, security catastrophe for, for your privacy and security if you're sharing something like admin user interface through your Onion address to the whole world. Finally, traffic and timing correlation attacks. This is actually a very ge general problem. If you build any kind of anonymity system that offers real-time online anonymity, there is a problem that traffic timing and correlation attack always works. Somehow it always works. And the problem is that you are transferring some traffic pattern in, and there is some kind of anonymity system and then the traffic goes out. And if someone is able to look the traffic going in and out, the attacker is able to correlate that this person is sending the traffic and then there is something going on in the middle, but the traffic is definitely going, going out here. And how you implement the anonymity system inside this cloud, it doesn't really help here because if you are just looking at the traffic going in and compare it to traffic going out, and if it's a real-time anonymity system like web browsing, TCP connection, then you can do traffic and timing correlation attacks. It doesn't have to be mathematically sophisticated. You can do that, for instance, there was this case that there was this Harvard student who made a bomb threat just before the final exam of the university. And the FBI was, using the, uh, was thinking that who would like to send a hoax bomb threat just before the final exam? Maybe a student who, who likes to move the time of the final exam. And they noticed that, okay, it, it was sent using and after that, they asked from the university campus 
do you have, by the way, some kind of monitoring system? They, they had one. And then they just look at that, OK, there was one guy who connected to Tor network just before this email came. And after that, he stopped using Tor. And he was the only one who was using Tor at the time. And after that, the FBI went to ask from the student that, was it you? And he confessed it. And they closed the case like immediately. Of course, you can say that, of course, the student student has plausible deniability because it's hard to actually prove that he sent it the email because if he is using Thor at the at the moment the email is arriving that doesn't really prove that it was the student but still he is the first one he's the first target of the FBI mind suspect is on him so this, this can help law enforcement. They can do traffic and timing correlation attack if they have some extra information that maybe the user is from this network. And you can do the same thing against, uh, against hidden services or Tor browsers. For instance, if the attacker is sending traffic to hidden services and is able to monitor Tor card traffic. Card is the first node which is connected to the hidden service. So the first entry card node sees the real IP address of the Onion server. It doesn't know that it's, uh, it is hidden service, but it knows that there is a Tor connection going to this real IP address. And if the attacker is able to for instance, if he is running the card node and sending the traffic and doing traffic and timing correlation attack, he is able to see that, OK, I'm sending traffic here, and it goes out to this Onion service here. And he is able to tell that, OK, it looks like this is the real IP address of the Onion site. And if you think about it, for, for surveillance agency, like the NSA is probably looking these entry card connections because they they are spying optic fibers. They are they are spying backbone connections. So it's likely that they are already doing this and just waiting that okay maybe we can send some traffic there and look if we can find some interesting onion sites just using this technique. It's it's something that. Like how, how I see it, if, if I would work inside the NSA, I would definitely do that. So I think that's like give you the clue that if this is doable, they might do it. And I tested this myself. I, I built a test network actually in, inside Finland. I have multiple purposes for this kind of test network, but I, I decided to build this test network with some other hackers. Most of them are actually here in this room. And I'm controlling some of the nodes of the network. And I tested to, to tra traffic and timing correlation attack there. So I selected some hidden services. And after that, I started to send traffic to the hidden services. I have a video about it, video demo. So what I'm doing, I'm basically just downloading information from the hidden service. Then my script sleeps. And after that, it's, it's downloading again information from the hidden service. So the traffic pattern looks like this download, sleep, download. And this is the traffic pattern I'm taking from card node. So this is the entry card node in that network on left. And I can definitely see that there is this same traffic pattern going in to this public IP address. So I can actually tell that, OK, the hidden service is on this IP address. So this is how 
how you can do traffic and timing correlation attack. If you are a large attacker, you are able to send this kind of traffic pattern to each and every one of known onion addresses. It's doable. And if you are able to, for instance, look only a fraction of car traffic, you are actually able to de-anonymize some, de -anonymize some random onion addresses using this technique. I think it's doable this way. This actually scales. But we can take this even further. You can actually look what kind of traffic there is. You can just look the encrypted traffic pattern from the Tor user. For instance, if you are doing local surveillance and somebody, somebody is using a Tor browser, you can just look what what, what kind of packets there are going over time. And we tested that, and we actually noticed that it looks pretty clear here when, when I'm opening, for instance, seven times ahmia.fi, the traffic pattern is pretty clear. Compared it that I open it seven times duckduckgo.com, you can actually look the traffic pattern that duckduckgo.com and ahmia.fi are giving different fingerprint, kind of like how the tra what is the shape of the encrypted traffic. And you don't have to encrypt the traffic. You can just look that, OK, there's, this looks like ahmia.fi. And at the moment, I'm training a neural network to learn this fingerprint and look. Um, Am I able to? Am I able to quest some sites like Onion sites and popular websites from encrypted traffic? I also noticed that this works for VPN connections too. So if the local attacker is just looking encrypted VPN connections, he is able to look the data pat pattern and tell something about the browsing activity. But uh, there is one but here. The number of false positives is high. And this is because there is always a website online that looks like another website based on this fingerprint. So I'm definitely sure that there are hundreds or thousands of sites that look like ahmia.fi according to this downloading package when I'm opening the website. So the number of false positives is high, and that's actually the best protection against this at the moment. We could actually look some alternative systems. We have been talking about Tor browser, which is the usual tool people are using. But there are more secure alternatives. And by the way, how many of you has tested Tails? Yeah, so, so like one third of them already knows that Tails is a live Linux distribution. It routes every piece of traffic through Tor network, and it doesn't uh, make any changes to disk. So this is a live operation system. You just input disk or USB stick and run the whole operation system from there. And, uh, it routes all the traffic through Tor networks, so by default, any software there is behind Tor. And what you get is that even if the attacker is able to compromise the browser, if there is some zero-day exploit against the browser, and the attacker is able to break the browser, he, he cannot get the direct access to network, and he cannot uh, cannot know what is the real, real public IP address. Actually, he has to get root access to this Linux system. And that's, of course, step harder to do that. You have to, you have to 
first break the browser, you have to have zero-day exploit against the browser. After that, you need another zero-day exploit against the operating system to get the root access. So this makes, makes it much harder. And Tails looks like this, live Linux operation system where everything is routed to Thor. This can be done even more secure way. And Hoonix is a system like this. It's again a Linux distribution. The solution is that you are running two separate virtual machines. The other machine is a gateway. It routes traffic to Tor. The other machine is a desktop machine. And this desk desktop machine is only communicating through this Tor gateway. And the idea there is that even if the attacker is able to first, for instance, break the Tor browser, get the zero-day exploit there, get the connection to the host machine, and he is able to totally compromise this desktop machine. Still, this machine doesn't know the real public IP address of the host because this is connected to Tor Gateway. And this is pretty hard to actually hack if you think about it. Even though you get the full access to first machine, you, sh you, sh you should next somehow break the Tor Gateway system to know the real IP address of the user. Of course, if you are able to compromise the desktop, desktop environment, after that you see everything that the user is typing there. But this really, really tries to take step, step to even more secure, more anonymous internet browsing. And there are alternative systems for Tor. If you look at English Wikipedia, there's a category of anonymous file sharing networks, and there are 24 different anonymity networks available. And you have to really think that if you really want to, for instance, just transfer one file or multiple file or email anonymously, you don't actually need real-time anonymity network. You can use some of these mixer systems because it's relatively easy to build very secure email mixer system. If, the, if there is a large number of people using an email, email mixer system, it really provides pretty complete anonymity. That is because you don't have to, have to act real-time, so you can, you can uh, take care of the traffic and timing correlation attacks because you can add multiple delays to the system. So the conclusion is how, how secure is Tor? So we have to actually look, look at it like this. I made these four categories and then I look at that some of these are the responsibilities of the user. Some of these are responsibilities of Tor project. And some of these are technical, some of these are non-technical. And if you think about it, operation security, it's, it's on user responsibility to take care of the operation security side. And it's, it's really, it's usually non-technical thing. You need the mindset of operation security. Should I write this information? Should I share this link? Should I think that somebody is constantly trying to combine this information, what I'm sharing, and maybe trying to link my real identity and my uh, pseudonym identity together? And this is non-technical thing, this mindset. Of course, there's technical side. You should read every tutorial and config configuration manual that Tor project is offering you. It's your responsibility to read the limitations of Tor, what you should do, what the dialogue, what, 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 if Tor browser is asking something, what that means, this technical stuff. You should consider reading it. 
But of course, it's totally Tor project responsibility to offer these guidelines and tutorials to the user. And of course, it's Tor project's uh, responsibility to offer a secure system. So they have to patch these security problems. They have to keep the software safe. And this is the long answer to the question, how secure is Tor and what does it mean that it's somehow secure and tries to keep, keep your online activity hidden? It's a large network and it's, it, it can do that in some way. That it's a large anonymity set. There are, there are over 4 million user, users over 60,000 onions, over 7,000 relays. So you can hide yourself to this large anonymity set. And that's the largest defense of the system. And, for, and it's a fortunate for Tor that it's not enough just to, for instance, monitor a segment of internet traffic. If you want to break Tor anonymity, you have to monitor every, everything, online activity, everywhere, every single backbone connection in every country if you really, really like to do it like that. The real problems are conf configurations and leaky web softwares. Those are very problematic because if you install just some web framework, the web framework documentation doesn't tell you that, by the way, we have this localhost user interface thing. It doesn't there are cases that you just install it, and after a year you notice it from the documentation that there is actually this information page that I am sharing through my Onion service, and I didn't even know that there is this information page about my server configuration now online. So web, frame for web, fra web softwares are quite leaky in that sense. Still. The weakest link of the system is the user itself. So if you fail your operation security, if you look at these cases, think about like the case Alpha Pay. Guy was running the largest, largest drug market in the world. Still he made those mistakes that he was using his real name and his uh, Hotmail email address there. So it's it's hard thing. Hard thing to keep yourself operationally secure. Thank you. <laughs> I think we have time for some questions. Yes, from there. All right, so is there any estimate about how many of the guard servers are actually operated by the intelligence services? I cannot know. It's impossible to know that kind of. How many card, entry card node there could be controlled by intelligence services? It, I cannot know that, but they actually, they don't even have to control those servers because Many intelligent services are able to just look the web traffic, so they don't have to make any effort to install those servers. It's enough if they are just monitoring the traffic to these entry nodes. But I, I don't know the answer. Yeah, so it's enough that they monitor the ISP of the whoever has it. You got. Give it first, okay? Uh, so besides the security issue, there is with Tor and especially like uh, Tails and Phonix, there is problem of usability. So only people who really, really want the anonymity will go for installing and figuring it out. So in your opinion, uh, do you think those tools would actually look to improve the usability so a generic user, meaning those like for now 4 million, uh, users will increase and increase this anonymity pool. Would they go? Would it go for it in any foreseen future? Mm, like usability features. 
I mean, like making it much easier to install. Like, for example, if I'm just, I don't know, watching TV series, whatever, I will use Google Chrome and care less. But when I, you know, need to like use the dark web or whatever, I'll go Tor. So it kind of already narrows down the scope of the search. So would they consider make it more usable for the general user, like painters or whatever? Of course, it's like the main target of the whole project to make it usable to everyone, because the whole network benefits from the usability. Usability is hard. Everyone who works in the field of security knows that there is always these trade-offs between security and usability. That's, that's many cases the trade-off we have to make, that the, it's harder to use things that are made to, to secure. And uh, if, if, if secure, uh, we, of course, we want that Tor browser is more secure and more use, usable. So you mentioned timing correlation attacks and uh, also fingerprinting attacks with the basis of uh, snake eating a pig. Couldn't these attacks be made much harder and frustrated by inserting random noise, such as downloading random things in the background? Actually, yes. I think Tor Project, Tor project is actually, at the moment, adding a padding to the packets. So there is some kind of padding added to packets in the future, or even now, some experimental version of Tor that tries to make this harder. Still, you cannot remove the problem completely. And that is because if you are adding noise to any signal, you are still able to get the signal if you have enough samples. So you cannot remove really the problem completely. You can make it much harder, and that's what Tor project tries to do at the moment. What's happening? We need more mics. Yeah. Uh, what about if the intelligence uh, has like 20% uh, of the network? And so uh, I think the five nodes um, which are for normal connections, or eight nodes which are uh, used when connecting to a heater service. When, when the intelligence has, has control in, in these nodes, the all nodes, uh, can it decrypt the traffic completely? Or can it, uh, I think that it, it can see uh, that from what, uh, what EP address add to what EP address it is connecting and even imposter and hidden service. But is that possible, or does the Tor network encrypt data in any other way? Like, I, I, I didn't get the question. At the moment, if you are looking at the situation, the hidden service is, of course, a server that is connected to the Tor network. So the first step, the first entry card sees the real IP address of the server, of course. Yeah, but when the, uh, when the request goes further in the turn network, the first uh, node, the entry card, is w when it's controlled by an intelligence and it's, it connects to the next node, which is uh, connected to, uh, owned by the intelligence also, uh, I think it, they can correlate the request, and now it's 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 the same request the client is using, and and so they can correlate it and and actually prove that it's the yep. it's a so request, and and when when they connect to the third and so so and to the last node, they can they can prove that the, it's the same request. Yeah. 
and so so impersonate it. So in a case that, uh, for instance, the attacker is controlling every single of these three servers, of course, then it, then the attacker is able to see that this connection is coming from my first entry node, and it's going to this this middle node that I'm running, and after that exiting from this third step, then then the attacker is able to de-anonymize the connection, of course. Yeah, that's the, that's the point that I was asking. asking yeah. Like, uh, but uh, so so in the start you said that in a small fraction of seconds, uh, no, no second connections, they they are able to de-anonymize uh, random users. That was from the NSA slides. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they tell there. So I'm I believing that they, because the NSA cannot probably see the whole traffic of the internet. It only sees small piece of traffic of the whole world, not everything. They are able to probably monitor some of the nodes, and sometimes they are able to break the whole circuit because they see every TCP connection there. Yeah. So the true network does not have any protection against this, No, not any encryption that it may have or something. Uh, and I think uh, some time ago, uh, Tor added uh, uh, the relay, first relay that, that persists between, I think, days, months, like the, that. So the de-anonymizing is harder. But that was my my point to ask ask at that. No, there is no protection against yeah. that scenario. It's 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 out of the threat model. So if you look the first paper about onion routing that describes the system in in abstract way, they tell that onion routing system is not secure if the attacker is able to look the traffic between nodes on the system. Yeah. Thank you. As a possible mitigation for the correlation attack, could you add delay in kind of random nodes, like have, have some nodes randomly putting in delay so that uh, you would lose the correlation? Would that mitigate fully the correlation attack? Well, the problem technically is that Tor provides TCP connection, and TCP is a real-time packet connection. So you cannot r really add those delays on real-time TCP connections. Okay, you mentioned a uh, couple other uh, like alternatives. Uh, you mentioned Hunix. Uh, how about Cubes? Like that trusts like nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cubes is another option. It's like Hunix system that is using Cubes. I think you are. Okay, so uh, what's your opinion on cubes in general? Is it okay, good, what not? Well, I think it's more secure in the sense that they have designed the operating, operate, operation system very security focused. Of course, it's probably even harder to use than these uh, pretty hard to use systems like Hunix. So, you can, you can make these systems, but there is always a trade-off between usability and how many people you are actually reaching with the system. If it's very obscure and hard to use, then only few people are using it. Yeah, yeah. That's it. In the beginning, you had the slide showing the Tor usage statistics, and there was this recent hope of one million users from 3 million to 4 million. Do you have any idea what this is about? Is there some new botnet hiding behind Tor or something? Well, I, I, I cannot know because the Tor project and the method they are gathering this data does not relieve, it, relieve any information what these clients are actually doing. I think I have to thank you because I think my time is, is up now. Thank you.